Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another episode of Cannabis Common Sense. We uh, have a good show for you tonight. We've got Eddie with Weed Man, the Newport Weed Man Bigger here. Hey, welcome Eddie. Hey guys. Uh, standing Welcome. by in the wings, Mr. John Cornette has hey. some great songs for you. We two. have some technical difficulties on our news segment. Normally, I just read the news directly from a teleprompter right in front of the lens. But tonight, we haven't been able to get that teleprompter to work, but we still have a lot of hemp news. So I'll be reading it from this little screen right here in just a moment. So stay tuned as we bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Okay, again, we have a little uh, problem with our teleprompter tonight, so I'll be reading from this screen right here instead of the one there. That explains that for you viewers. Starting tomorrow, OLCC license holders in the adult recreational marijuana market must notify the OLCC at least one day prior to harvesting marijuana so the state can be there to inspect if they so choose. Also, without any notice whatsoever, just uh, last Friday, the uh, uh, or OLCC, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, which is in charge of the, medic, the adult uh, recreational marijuana market, announced that they were going to change the rules for Oregon medical marijuana program patients, effective immediately. Apparently, with no notice to the Oregon Health Authority and no notice to anyone else, the OLCC change the limits for medical patients. The limits for everyone buying from the OLCC is one ounce per day. But, uh, the o and for patients, it has been 24 ounces that a patient could purchase at any one time. However, the OLCC, based on three people apparently who were buying 24 ounces repeatedly, one bought uh, eight pounds in less than a week is what I heard. They changed the program for all other participants. Instead of just concentrating on the bad actors, they changed it for all the patients and uh, effective immediately medical marijuana patients are also limited to one ounce. Now a group of us are uh, going to be at the next OLCC meeting on Wednesday, September 19th to protest in front of the OLCC in Milwaukee. So for more information about that, you can call us at 503-235 Four six zero six. We'll be having guests on in the coming weeks to talk about this. Again, Wednesday, September 19th at the OLCC headquarters on McLaughlin in Milwaukee, Oregon. We'll be protesting this arbitrary uh, change by the OLCC for all patients to limit them to purchase one ounce at a time. Also, the OLCC is asking the uh, state legislature for seven million dollars more to inspect medical marijuana gardens uh, so they are the olcc wants seven million dollars to be allocated so they can start inspecting medical marijuana gardens uh, in another piece of legislative news here in oregon the oregon normal and a group called the new Revol new coalition kicks off uh, the oregon marijuana social consumption spaces bill they're trying to get a bill passed by the legislature. They have State Representative Frederick Liu uh, as a backer on this, and uh, uh, they would allow consumption bars for adults to use cannabis at a social location. Currently, due to the Clean Air Act and enforcement by the state, they haven't really allowed open bars for adults to use cannabis in a public place. 
Our next story is from Washington, D.C. The White House has secretly amassed a committee of federal agencies from across the government to combat support for marijuana and cast state legalization measures in a negative light while attempting to portray the drug as a national threat. The new White House organization is called the Marijuana Policy Coordination Committee, and it's named in White House memos and emails. It instructed 14 federal agencies and the Drug Enforcement Administration this month to submit data demonstrating the significant negative trends about marijuana and the threats it poses to the country. In an, an ironic twist, the committee complained in one memo that the narrative about marijuana is unfairly biased in favor of the drug. But rather than seek objective information, the committee's records show it's asking officials only to portray marijuana in a negative light, regardless of what the data shows. This new White House uh, committee had a summary of a July 27th meeting of the White House in nine departments and says, quote, the prevailing marijuana narrative in the United States is partial, one-sided, and inaccurate in favor of marijuana, end quote. In a follow-up memo which provided guidance for responses from federal agencies, White House officials told uh, department officials, quote, departments should provide the most significant data demonstrating negative trends with a statement describing the implications of such trends, end quote. As several states have approved laws allowing adults to use and purchase cannabis, critics have contended lax attitudes will promote drug abuse, particularly among youth, and they've pressed for a federal crackdown. The White House at one point said more cannabis enforcement would be forthcoming, though President Donald Trump has never said he was on board with that agenda, and he announced in June that he really supports new bipartisan legislation in Congress that would let state marijuana legalization thrive. However, the committee's hardline agenda and deep bench suggest an extraordinarily far-reaching effort to reverse public attitudes and scrutinize those states that have changed marijuana laws. It reports are to be used in a briefing for Trump, quote, on the marijuana threat, end quote. Their meeting summary says, quote, staff believe that if the administration is to turn the tide on increasing marijuana use, there's an urgent need to message the facts about the negative impacts of marijuana production and trafficking on national health, safety, and security, end quote. Of course, that's inaccurate. The use of marijuana has actually gone down with legalization, so uh, there's no accuracy in that. Uh, the White House declined to discuss the committee's process, but indicated it was part of an effort to remain consistent with the president's agenda. Quote, the Trump administration's policy coordination process is an internal deliberative process to craft the pol president's policies on a number of important issues facing the American people and ensure consistency with the president's agenda. End quote, said Lindsey Walters, the deputy White House press secretary. None of the documents indicate that officials are seeking data that show marijuana consumption or legalization laws, which have been approved in eight states, serve any public benefit or do a better job of reducing drug abuse. Coordinated by White House's Office of National Drug Control Policy, the office of the infamous drug czar, uh, they say that uh, uh, the committee met on July 27th with many of the largest agencies in the federal government, including the Departments of Justice, Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, and the Department of State. An unclassified summary of the meeting uh, says the memo is pre-decisional and requires a close hold. They, in other words, they don't want this memo to get out, but it has. And it says the notes were not to be distributed externally. The White House followed up the next week by sending agencies and other departments, including the Departments of Defense, Education, Transportation, and Veterans Affairs, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency, instructions to submit two-page bulletin fact sheets that identify marijuana threats and issues with the initiative by August 10th. Why, it, in other words, three weeks ago. While spokespeople at those agencies declined to comment on the committee itself, asked if the Education Department had submitted its response to the White House, Liz Hill, a spokesperson for the Education Department, told us, quote, I'm told we did turn it in on time to the White House, end quote. A State Department spokesperson said the State Department regularly coordinates with the Office of National Drug Control Policy on a wide range of drug control issues. For specific questions about the Marijuana Policy Coordination Committee, we refer you to the 
Office of National Drug Control Policy, end quote, from the State Department. Neither the ONDCP officials or the White House press office responded to requests from BuzzFeed News or Rolling Stone magazine to comment on the committee. The departments were told, quote, to identify marijuana threats, issues created by state marijuana initiatives and consequences of use, production and trafficking on national health, safety and security, end quote. The White House guidance says that the agency should also provide an example of a, quote, story relating an incident or picture that illustrates one or more of the key areas of concern related to production and trafficking of marijuana, end quote. The agencies were asked to describe how the drug poses threats to their department and the consequences of marijuana against national health and security. Our own Portland Congressional Representative Earl Blumenauer put it aptly when he said, quote, we've always been challenged because of the failed war on drugs is very deeply embedded in the federal government. You still have agencies that are getting in the way of thoughtful research. You have zealots who've made a career out of this, end quote, according to Representative Blumenauer. Our response is go out and vote and vote for people who aren't uh, paranoid about cannabis, who favor marijuana legalization and, and less onerous restrictions and overregulation. Our next story is about banking here in the United States. It's well known that many banks will not open accounts for marijuana businesses out of fear of running afoul of the United States government's continued criminalization of the drug. But one major institution just took the financial services industry cannabis cash paranoia a step further, saying what appears to be a first that it won't do business with political candidate because she received donations from cannabis industry interests. Wells Fargo, the fourth largest bank in the United States, fired Florida Agriculture Commissioner candidate Nikki Freed as a client this month after her campaign has received donations from lobbyists from the medical marijuana industry, according to copies of emails her campaign made public on Monday. A vice president and senior manager at Wells Fargo, Antoinette Infante, told uh, in a July 11th email to the Freed Campaign's compliance officer, quote, as part of the ongoing onboarding of the client, it was uncovered some information regarding the customer's political platform and that they are advocating for expanding patient access to medical marijuana, end quote. Because of ongoing federal marijuana prohibition, many banks have remained wary about working with marijuana businesses, even as a growing number of states move to legalize or, uh, it for recreational or medical purposes. But Wells Fargo's move appears to be the first time a financial institution's denied banking services to a candidate for public office as a result of donations from the cannabis industry. Florida voters overwhelmingly approved medical cannabis ballot measure in November 2016, but its implementation has been slow and contentious as advocates and state officials battle over issues such as a ban on smoking the drug. While the Freed campaign would not have significant oversight of medical marijuana issues if elected as Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services, she's regularly mentioned the issue during the course of her campaign. That conflict has had banks, large and small, walking in line for more than a decade since the first states began changing their cannabis laws. In fact, I myself have been through 19 different bank closures. Once at Wells Fargo, they closed 22 of my bank accounts, 12 of them political, three of them my personal accounts, uh, and, and so the others were my uh, clinic business accounts. So I have actually been through 19 different bank closures since 2007, over the past 12 years. But uh, marijuana growers have struggled to open and maintain bank accounts and dispensaries have relied on cash to do business instead of credit cards. Businesses like construction companies and electricians have provided services to growers and distributors have also had problems. Despite the fear that many banks have about working with the marijuana industry, Recent federal data shows that a growing number of financial institutions are actively opening and maintaining accounts for cannabis businesses. Most of those are small community banks and savings and loans. There are several in Washington and Oregon that are opening up to that. But we'll have more about uh, the evolving federal banking situation on future shows. 
out of Washington, D.C., Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware and Rod Blum of Iowa announced the Clean Slate Act, or H.R. 6669, along with 22 original co-sponsors to seal the records for marijuana charges one year after the sentence is completed. The Clean Slate Act is important legislation that would ease the burden felt by those unjustly suffering the collateral consequences resulting from cannabis prohibition. Individuals saddled with marijuana possession convictions are disproportionately either people of color or at the lowest rungs of the economic ladder, and it's essential that they are not held back from being able to obtain employment, housing, access to higher education, and all the other necessities of being an active participant in their community. Having been arrested for mere marijuana possession does not make one a bad person, but rather a victim of a cruel public policy. Uh, we urge you to send a message to your congressional representatives in favor of the Clean Slate Act, that's H.R. 6669. The Clean Slate Act, H.R. 6669. Our next couple of stories are from Springfield, Illinois. Republican Governor Bruce Rauner signed legislation into law on Tuesday permitting physicians to recommend medical cannabis to pain patients in lieu of opioids. Uh, Illinois Senate Bill 336, which took effect immediately, permits doctors to recommend cannabis for any medical condition for which an opioid has been or could be prescribed by a physician based on generally accepted standards of care. The new law also makes several other patient-centric changes to the state's medical marijuana program, such as authorizing applicants with a provisional registration to purchase medical cannabis upon submitting their paperwork. The Illinois Governor Rauner posted to his Twitter account, quote, we have a new weapon against opioid abuse. Medical pros can now prescribe cannabis instead of opioids for pain management. Science wins again, end quote, Illinois Governor Rauner said. According to data published last year in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Care, enrollees in Illinois' medical marijuana program frequently reported using cannabis as an alternative to other medications, most commonly opioids. Uh, numerous observational studies report that medical marijuana regulation is correlated with reductions in opioid-related use, drug spending, abuse, hospitalization, and mortality. Separate data evaluating prescription drug use trends among individual patients enrolled in state-licensed medical marijuana programs is consistent with this conclusion, finding that many chronic pain patients reduce or eliminate their use of opioids following medical marijuana enrollment. Illinois joys, joins New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, each of which explicitly permit physicians to recommend medical marijuana for opioid-related diagnoses. Illinois' Republican Governor Bruce Rauner also signed legislation into law authorizing the state of Illinois to license individual farmers to grow hemp for commercial purposes. The new law, which took effect immediately, also expands the state's existing hemp program. Under the 2014 pilot program, only universities were permitted to produce hemp for research purposes. The new act allows any individual, partnership, firm, corporation, company, society, or association to apply for hemp cultivation licenses. According to Governor Rauner in his statement, he said, quote, legalizing the farming of industrial hemp just makes good sense, end quote. Over 40 states have enacted statutes distinguishing hemp from marijuana and authorizing its license production. According to estimates provided by the advocacy group Vote Hemp, U.S. farmers legally cultivated over 23,000 acres of hemp for seed, fiber, and CBD last year. Our next story is out of Israel. Most Israeli pain specialists with an opinion on the issue believe that cannabis is a safe and effective analgesic agent according to survey research published in the Journal of Pain Research. The investigators surveyed the opinion of over half of all practicing pain clinicians in Israel. The Israeli government has regulated the prescriptive use of cannabis for much of the past decade. The authors reported that virtually all of the survey's respondents prescribed cannabis to their patients and that 56% of them reported the substance to possess, quote, mild or no adverse side effects, end quote. 45% of those surveyed stated that they themselves would prefer to be treated with cannabis rather than opiates in the case of chronic pain. The authors concluded, quote, in the current survey, which probed the attitudes, beliefs, knowledge, and collected experience of pain specialists using cannabis in their daily practice, 
Cannabis emerges as an effective treatment option for many patients with chronic pain who have failed previous treatments. Moreover, their responses arguably present a possible change of paradigm and the possibility to consider cannabis earlier in the course of a disease and not as a last result, end quote. According to a 2017 literature review conducted by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine here in the United States, there exists, quote, conclusive or substantial clinical evidence that cannabis is effective for the treatment of chronic pain, end quote. This study, Personal Experience and Attitude of Pain Management Specialists in Israel Regarding the Medical Use of Cannabis for Chronic Pain, appears in this month's edition of the Journal of Pain Research. Our next story is from Hartford, Connecticut. Patients with severe rheumatoid arthritis, spasticity disorders, and neuropathic facial pain are among those who are now eligible for marijuana therapy in the state of Connecticut following a decision this week by regulators to expand the program's list of qualifying conditions. Under the just announced rules, doctors may, for the first time in Connecticut, recommend medical cannabis to patients with the following diagnosis. Spasticity, severe rheumatoid arthritis, post-herpetic neuralgia, hydrocephalus, intractable headache, neuropathic facial pain, muscular dystrophy, and osteogenesis imperfecta, aka broken bone disease. Over 27,000 Connecticut citizens are currently enrolled in that state's medical cannabis program. Our next story tonight is from San Francisco. Marijuana use by adolescents continues to decline in California, according to statewide data provided by the California Healthy Kids Survey, a biennial survey funded by the California Department of Health and Education. Among seventh graders, 4.2% reported ever having used cannabis during the years 2015 to 2017, as compared to 7.9% in the years 2013 through 2015, a reduction of 47%. Among ninth graders, the reduction was 25%, and among 11th graders, the reduction was 16 percent. The percentage of teens reporting using cannabis multiple times or repeatedly within the past 30 days also declined for all age groups. The initial reports confirmed that legalizing and regulating cannabis doesn't increase, increase youth marijuana use, but rather it has the opposite effect. The fact that the biggest drop in reported use came from younger age groups is a particularly encouraging indicator of the success of cannabis regulation. California law legalized the adult use, possession, and cultivation of marijuana by adults on, in November of 2016, and the retail adult use marijuana sales did not go into effect until January of this year. The studies are consistent with those other studies from other states finding that the enactment of adult marijuana use laws is not associated with upticks in young people's use of marijuana. This study, School Climate, Substance Abuse, and the Well-Being Among California Students, 2015 through 2017 is available online at the California government website. Next story is also from Israel. Israeli uh, patients suffering from fibromyalgia frequently use cannabis to treat chronic pain and other symptoms of the disease, according to data published in the journal Pain Research and Treatment. Israeli researchers surveyed over 2,700 fibromyalgia patients. Of those who responded to the questionnaire, 84% reported consuming cannabis. The authors wrote, quote, pain relief was reported by 94% of cannabis consumers, while 93% reported improved sleep quality, 87% reported improvement in depression, and 62% reported improvement in anxiety. The authors concluded, in addition, nearly 85% of the patients either completely stopped taking any other pain medications or reduced the dosages of other meds. This reflects the advantage of cannabis over other medications in alleviating pain, in addition to its favorable effects on sleep and mood, end quote. This study, the consumption of cannabis by fibromyalgia patients in Israel, appears in this month's edition of Pain Research and Treatment. And our last story tonight is from India. Ethanol-based tinctures uh, containing crushed cannabis leaves provide antibacterial effects against MRSA are methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or according to data published in the Journal of Integrative Medicine. Strains of MRSA bacterium are often resistant to antibiotic treatment and can be associated with life threatening infections such as septic shock and severe pneumonia. 
A team of researchers from India assessed the antimicrobial activities of cannabis leaf extracts, along with extracts from the leaves of the plants, uh, Thuja orientalis, a form of cypress, and Cidium guava, lemon guava, against MRSA. The authors reported that each of the individual extracts inhibited MRSA growth, but these effects were more profound when cannabis was used in combination with uh, the form of cypress, Thuja orientalis. They concluded, quote, ethnololic or alcohol extracts of cannabis sativa alone and in combination with Thuja orientalis provide two potential therapeutic agents for use against MRSA infections, end quote. Prior studies demonstrated that the constituents in cannabis plant possess potent antibacterial and antifungal properties which are capable of halting the spread of MRSA and malaria under controlled conditions. This study, Antimicrobial Activity of Cannabis Sativa, Thuja Orientalis, and Sididium Guan Java leaf extracts against MRSA appears in the Journal of Integrative Medicine. That is the end of our lengthy hemp news segment tonight. And Mr. John Cornett has very patiently been standing by ready to play a great cannabis song for you. <laughs> Welcome back, John. Thank you, brother. Uh, you know, I'm glad you ended it on a positive note because that negative news, you know, we know that cannabis heals and we also know that um, uh, we've been lied to grossly. And I think that we need to get it straight here. And it's really sad that we don't have more support from our mainstream. Come on, guys. You know, this, this stuff works. Anyway. This is a song uh, done by Uwe Baton, and uh, he wrote this beautiful little song that I'm going to do for you right now. It's called The Roots of It, or The Cannabis Song. It goes like this. Hey, Scott. I don't hear me on the monitors there. This is the cannabis song, hey, hey, yeah, yeah, aha, uh -huh. this is the cannabis song. If you know the roots of it, then you will find the truth in it. If you know the roots of it, then you will make good use of it. Now they have been hiding the truth for so long. Trying to tell the people Using herb is so wrong It has been there for ten thousands of years Now it's time to drive away those fears Come on people, open up your ears That's why we're singing it loud and clear If you know the rules of it Then you will find the truth in it if you know the roots of it, then you will make good use of it. Hey, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. this is the cannabis song. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. this is the cannabis song. Bob Marley said, excuse me, while I light my spliff. Knowing that the cannabis is a precious gift Because they told us so many lies For well, some people it might be a surprise To see my spliff as a blessing in disguise Time for the herb to win the Nobel Prize If you know the roots of it Then you will find the truth in it if you know the roots of it, then you will find a use for it. Hey, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. this is the cannabis song. Hey, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. this is the cannabis song. 
So I beg you, do not turn you into criminals by disclaiming, by disclaiming, by declaring something good until you're legal. It, it is helpful, it is useful, it is natural. And for the meditation, separation of and all over the world, it's an international. From the roster man down to the cardinal, they use it as a holy sacrament. Well, spiritual, the only crime about it, it's still illegal. If you know the truth of it, and you will find the roots of it. And if you know the roots of it, then you will find the truth in it. Hey, 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 hey. Mm -hmm. This is the cannabis song. Hey, 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 hey. Mm -hmm. This is the cannabis song. Woo! Thank you, Yui. That's it. <laughs> okay. <I'm here. laughs> Right. That's the first time you played that one publicly? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. It has a good message. Uh, that's uh, Yui Baton. He's, he's an awesome. Look up his music on YouTube. Is he a reggae player? He's the whole reggae. He got some other, he's, he's awesome. You got to go look him up. I got All a lot right. of songs like this. That's a good one. We'll have you back at the end of the show to take us out, John. Hey, Eddie. Welcome to the show hey again. It's good to be back. <coughs> you yeah. are the Newport Weed Man. Yep. So you have uh, been... Uh, uh working on the coast working on a tv show out of salem mercy, yep. TV, mercy tv and yep. working on the coast uh, uh promoting a dispensary as a person on the side of the road who who right. uh draws people in but you've run into a problem <laughs> i understand with the local officials someone has complained and now local officials are saying you have to have a license before you can go back to work yep <clears throat> and yeah. so when did this happen to you Oh gosh, uh, on the tenth, on the tenth, I uh, turned in my license. Uh huh. Uh, a little, I, I don't know. Uh, Your application for my a applications new license. for a license. Yes, uh, can of bigotry is all I could say. You know, Paul. I right. mean, I've been out there for years, and now uh, I. Uh, some people got upset because I was out on the sidewalk. They said I couldn't be on the sidewalk. Came cursing and yelling at me, and I, I put it on my website. I put it on my Go Weed Man website. And I got like 19,000 hits. Uh -huh. It's crazy. I, I'll, I mean, I, I love my people. I love my fans. So that website, it's goweedman.com? Go, well, actually, there's, I've got a few. There's <clears throat> um, goweedman.com, which is my, my web, it's normal on website. Your shirt there. On there. weed, not speed. There we go. It's a message I like to send. Um, yeah. Uh, and also, it's on, uh, if you go to YouTube, you go on the Newport Weed Man YouTube. Uh -huh. uh, you can go ahead and look it up there. But... Um, the, what I put it on, if you want to look it up, I put it on my Weed Man. It's uh, Weed Man on uh, Facebook. And him coming out and saying, cursing and saying, you know, I couldn't be there. He's trying to run a business and all. I, when I've been there for the last couple of years and they, they so moved. you've been this, there for two years. I've and already some been there. Moves his business says, up and says, you can't be here because we have families here and children come around here. What is here. this business? It's called Simply Design. And what do they do? They're a studio. They're like they a they design take studio? They, well they take uh, like uh, high school pictures and oh I see uh, p uh, children with uh, well they with knew the, they were moving in next to a cannabis dispensary in between the they cannabis dispensary <laughs> they moved in between the cannabis dispensary and a place that used to be called Bayshore Glass but now they're called um, uh, I apologize. Now, now it's something else. So this else. is a pipe store. Well, yeah, the pipe saying. store was right like here. A pipe store is here. Store. And then here's the 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 uh, the what is it? The um the the simply designed studios. And then here's me. And I've been out on the corners all over the place. I mean, I've been saving lives. I'm, I kid you not. I have saved lives. I've I've watched people. I've told them don't smoke weed or speed smoke weed. I, I see them addicted to weed. I'd give them sp or speed. I give them cannabis. And and, and it's like. I've, I've seen people almost killed in, in the doggone intersection. I've stopped people from getting killed. And I've been, I've, I feel I've been a very a good, uh, uh, a good influence in the public public right. eye. Right. Um, I give to the soup kitchens. So far, the Lord's provided over $800 that I've given to five different soup kitchens. And you're not I'm, a wealthy guy. I'm you're not, wealthy not making guy. a lot not, of money out there. I'm not working there. right now because these H guys. How long have you been out of work? Since, since before the 10th. So more and than three weeks. Yes. More than three and, weeks, and they've cut like, your income. I've got things to pay, child support. I've got, 
I got to eat. I mean, even the, the, the money I make, I mean, it's not that much. I mean, in today's economy, for sure, I work six hours a day and, and I like to do what I do and educate. And I do a lot of these shows. And, and it's, a, it's a shame. It's like, you know, they're treating the cannabis industry as though they, they who are those or them, I don't know, who have this, such a bad opinion about us, us cannabis users. They, they, they've got this. It, it's like, and even the OLCC, Paul, I feel yeah, like my We God, talked it's, it's about like all this, these rules that they've it's like you can, I can take my daughter right into the, into the um, alcohol store. She's eight or ten, 11, just turned 11. I can take her into the alcohol store. She can walk around. She can look at the CBD shots up there that they sell for four ninety five. I didn't and know look, they were doing that liquor store. Out of the liquor stores, they sell these things, CBD shots. Huh. Right they're in Newport. And huh. I mean, even uh, other I haven't places even heard they, of that. Yeah, they, other places they sell CBD oils, um, C, CBD extracts from hemp. Uh huh. In in like uh, in a whole like packaging. But for place. some reason, you can't work promoting a store that these people knew was there when you they moved yes, in they moved there they moved in the middle or they they moved right in the middle they chased out um uh, oh it's called a perfect piece and uh, my, my my brother willie he he could have been hanging out with snoop dogg he said <laughs> at this other at some, at some event you know he was upset because they had told him you know told him he needs to get his license because i guess his license wasn't up to date so these people what does he I, do something similar to you or what he sells he? uh uh Glassware oh, I see. and vapes, vape juice, uh, bongs, pipes. You I know, see. It's a head shop kind of thing, and and he 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 will not sell uh, glass pipes for meth. Uh -huh. I I, well, I love that guy for that, yeah. and and you know I'm I'm thinking about protesting a couple sh places in town that do, you know, and it's right. unfortunate they do, and they'll sell the little meth pipes to people, but they'll hide, and it's see that's what I'm get I, I get to Paul, it's the can of bigotry how people act. That it's like this dark, even the federal yeah, government, like the we federal have government to be takes embedded. money from us. They're making money off of us right now. Yeah. And what are they doing? They're acting like, oh, cannabis is so terrible. It's so evil. Cacalosa, man. I mean, I'm telling you. Yeah. They've been, they, you know, they've had the. the um, cannabis is the uh, holy, you know, the that. main ingredient <laughs> of Christians' holy anointing yes. oil. You know, Christ means anointed one. Yes. And the oil that the that was used for anointing in in the bible in the old and new testament is mainly cannabis so it's just ignorance on these people's oh, yeah. part and this uh you, they have a vested interest there's zealots well, who have a financial I, interest just like representative blumenauer said in that news story i read right. at the top of the show well i'm i'm catholic and i know the catholic church has spent hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars trying to, to stop medical cannabis yeah yeah. And, because, and I mean, I've been to a church in uh, San Rafael, uh, Chile, mm -hmm. that has a big indica marijuana leaf carved into stone from 1650, right above the church and throughout the church. <laughs> so, uh, right, you know, the the Catholic Church is well aware that cannabis is the main ingredient in the whole. Really, that was in a Catholic oil. church. Yeah, yeah, wow. I've got pictures I could show right, you. Please do. Yeah, we have a video. We're going to roll. We're down to about 16, 17 minutes left. We have a short video. We'll be right back after this video. K2 News at 11, on your side. Police! There's one! Police! There's one! But first, cell phone video captures one of several raids federal authorities say cracked a huge marijuana smuggling operation, a ring they say was based in Portland and Lake Oswego. Good evening. Thanks for being with us, everybody. I'm Steve Dunn. K2's Bob High is live in northeast Portland along the string of legal marijuana shops nicknamed the Green Mile. And, Bob, federal prosecutors claim that illegal enterprise is a symptom of Oregon's legalized marijuana law. That's right, Steve, but supporters of legal marijuana and state regulators say that's just not true. Police! There's one! A neighbor's cell phone camera catches police using a battering ram on the southeast Portland home's front door. It is one of three homes, two in Portland and a third in Lake Oswego, that federal investigators say were used to send marijuana illegally to Texas and Virginia. A federal grand jury in Portland indicted six people, including locals 33-year-old Raleigh Dragon Lau and 38-year-old Paul Eugene Thomas, in the alleged smuggling operation. 
Authorities say the investigation seized 11,000 marijuana plants, 546 pounds of processed marijuana, $2.8 million in cash, 51 firearms, 26 vehicles, and a yacht. U.S. Attorney for Oregon Billy J. Williams said in a release, These cases provide clear evidence of what I have repeatedly raised concerns over. Oregon's marijuana industry is attracting organized criminal networks looking to capitalize on the state's relaxed regulatory environment. State regulators dispute that. They're not uh, licensees and they don't have marijuana worker permits. So the focus in this instance at least does not uh, directly shine light on our regulated system. Legalized marijuana advocates say prosecutors should blame criminals, not Oregon's marijuana law. Until we can regulate the market and uh, in those other states as well, which I think will happen inevitably, uh, there's always going to be a, a cash incentive. In fact, the OLCC says it recently installed new limits on medical marijuana and the amount that people can get weekly because they realized some people were abusing that system. It also put a new harvest reporting requirement in this year for marijuana grow operations across the state. Live in Northeast Portland, Bob High, K2 News. All right, Bob, thank you. Also So this was a Wednesday night story. Uh, they came by our office on Sandy Boulevard and, and filmed a little clip there. So, uh, you know, obviously marijuana has been exported out of Oregon since before I moved here back in 1984. Oregon is a major cannabis exporting state. None of these people who are arrested and indicted are licensed uh, cannabis growers at all. They're not medical, they're not recreational. You know, it's no surprise, I think, that uh, this sort of thing happened. But, well, I uh, wouldn't be surprised if there were some other drugs in there too. Yeah. You know? We have uh, a studio audience. You are welcome to come down and join our studio audience most any Friday night. And there is an off-camera microphone. And Judy has made her way to that off-camera microphone. And she's got something to say. Welcome back to the show, Judy. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, Mike's, Mike's position is just a little bit high. Hope the sound's coming through. Um, you know, all of this stuff, this legal stuff, and the OLCC thing for us here in Oregon. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm back to plead with everybody again. There's two things to do. Paul will tell us again about the demonstration that we are all going to show up for in Milwaukee on the 19th in order to protest these ridiculous limits and really all so much you know they imposed doing. these limits with no announcement they didn't ask mm -hmm. the oregon health authority mm -hmm. or anyone involved they just arbitrarily decided that they would impose these limits with no announcement no discussion just out of the blue i i have another comment and a plea for the Please. public but i really want to ask you where is the oregon cannabis cannabis commission where are they what are they doing they are meeting they are you know they really don't have any Teeth. They're an advisory committee. Um, uh, I haven't been going to these meetings. Uh, I know some people who have. Um, I'm sure they oppose that. And one of the people on the Oregon Cannabis Committee, which is a new body that was just came into existence earlier this year, appointed by the governor. And the, one of the people involved asked me to uh, publicize this Wednesday, September 19th meeting at the OLCC's office, which is on McLaughlin uh, Boulevard in uh, uh, central McWaukee, right on the highway through Milwaukee, Oregon. What time is that going to start, you think, Paul? Um, I'm not sure at this point. I'll have to be announcing that a little bit later. Right. I was just told about it last night, but I have, wasn't given a time yet. But we'll be announcing that. We'll be, we have a show a few days before that. We'll uh, have some guests on to talk about it. And, uh, uh, but we definitely want people to come out and protest these arbitrary changes by the OLCC. But there's something else we've all got to do. Mm -hmm. And it's always the same thing that we've got to do. And that is we have got to really get to know our representatives, your representative in the House and your state senator, we have got to know these people. Yeah. You've got to be in touch with them constantly. You've got to be helping them to learn 
And no, they deal with all the issues of the state. And the, a lot of the time, the only time that they see a lot of this stuff that's being done to us is after the fact, because these are not issues that they are voting on. Mm -hmm. And they have all the rest of the issues the state to deal with, right? So right. I, I, can't, I can't encourage people more strongly enough. There is no substitute. This is the time. Come out to the OLCC meeting and at least show yourself. If you don't, if you don't have to make your voice known, but be there, if nothing else. But there is no substitute for talking to your representatives. They don't bite. They're nice people. Get to know them. All right. Thank you, Judy. Again, we have a studio audience, and you're welcome to come in and join. You can also give us a call. If you're watching Friday night, hey, we're down to just 10 minutes left. But you can call us at that number there on your screen. It's 503-288-4442. You know, we have this banner turned around because, unbelievably, an Israeli-Canadian oil company came in and got a court order to restrict our ability to use the name of our Oregon nonprofit corporation, the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation, and THCF. So to find out more about that, or if you need to find a doctor to help you get a medical marijuana permit, then please give us a call at that number now on your screen, 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. If you have any condition, any of these conditions right here on your screen, or any others you think might, are anywhere in the country you think might help you with, you want help finding a doctor who can help you with medical marijuana, call us at 503-235-4606. Uh, we have a video with uh, Eddie Weedman uh, from Newport on the coast here in Oregon, and we'll be right back after this video. Yes! Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Look at your meal. Oh, wow. My name's Eddie, the Weed Man Bigger. Go weedman.com. Listen for me on 100.7 the Boss FM. <laughs> Woo! He's a man. That was awesome. People out here, man, they're great. All right. Well, there you are, <laughs> right in your I, natural I, environment. In my natural habitat. Well, that's right on right Highway now. 101 in yes. Weedman, but uh, in in Newport, Newport Oregon. Oregon yeah. But you haven't been allowed to work that job no, now no, for. I, I was told by the chief of police that I could. See, when I went in there to get the license, they says, well, you And what kind of business license they require? You're supposed to have a business license? Yeah, I'm supposed Even to though the store see, you're working for has a business license. They have a business license, but the police came up to the store and said to our manager, and she's a new manager, um, she says, she, the police officer says, well, does this guy work for you? She's like, well, yes, but no, he's an independent contractor. Because of the way they got to pay me, because my, my um, record, I couldn't get in the... The OLCC OLCC's thing, marijuana. The, the chief of police, you have to go through this, that town. You have to have the chief of police sign something. Oh, really? And, and, and I had him do it, and they say, he said no. So, and, and I believe, I don't know, if, if even if I tried to get my OLCC license to be a bud tender to work inside of the dispensary, I, I don't know if I could or not because I'm a felon. Mm -hmm. So When was your felon? Uh, 10, 15 years ago. You can definitely, is it a marijuana felony? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, you can get it expunged for one thing, and that won't affect your your, your well, conviction. Would have to be after two thousand and six to. Oh uh, no, I haven't had any felonies since then. Yeah, so I've been, I've been. You don't. You can apply for a state license if that'll help you with that dispensary. That might help me. But what but happens then, if you go out and you? Uh, <laughs> they said they'll give me a five hundred dollar fine uh -huh. if I go out there. Now, I, I also. Now, I think you have a free speech right to do that. Have you talked to any attorneys about no, representing your no. your free speech right to be there on the uh, sidewalk and well, do this? The, see, when I went and talked to the licensing people, the, the one thing that the, the people in the license department says, well, you better go talk to the, um, who was the guy, the African guy? The city planner. He asked, I had to talk to the city planner. And the one thing he said is, well, he goes, 
Well, I, I, first of all, I love seeing you out there. I've seen you out there. He's seen me out there for the last three years. And he says, I love to see you out there. You always make me smile. And he says, the one thing that you can't do is you can't have a sign on the sidewalk. But you can always, he says, and this is what he says, you can always have a sign that says anything on any sidewalk. Mm -hmm. You could say terrible things. You can say nice things. You can stand anywhere with any sign that says anything on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And now they've come to me and says, well, because um, I upset these guys. I mean, like I said, I put, I put it on, on video. There's, there's like 19,000 hits. Um, and this, this guy yelling at me, cursing at me for being on the sidewalk. I saw when that. When he knew I that, that I was there. Well, and he's know, attacking me. I'm sure and, the mean, ACLU, like, the American Civil Liberties Union, would be happy to help you if, if in I fact, mean, you oh, were charged with a crime there. So we should talk about some civil disobedience in lieu of your license. If they're not going to get, you can't go without eating and And, and I've been and doing working. it there for so many years and, and people love me there. I mean, I've, I've, I've gone to people, a lady passed away, Butler, her name was Butler. And her daughter says, you know, when she would drive by you, she, all the elderly people, they're like, they love you because I have energy and I, I'm out there and I'm happy and I'm smiling and I say, peace be with you. And I'm out there praying and it's like, you know, yeah, since I started, I've been shot in the face with an airsoft gun. I've been punched by these guys from Chevron on Chevron property. This guy punched me in the back, and the police let it go. They did nothing. He didn't even get a char charge with an assault. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm made to be the criminal, you know, and I've tried to be, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, yeah, I was a boss, you know, all to these guys, and, and, just, and use my military bearing, sir, yes, sir, sir, no, sir. I mean, I, I've been, like, badgered by these guys crazy. And, and I'm, just, I'm just praying that, that they'll, they'll sign off on this stuff so that I can get back out there and feed my family. I pay we child support. We should talk support. about getting the American Civil Liberties Union to help you out there and I about we you know, some civil disobedience in lieu of that license so that you can get out there and start working. Again. Well, yeah, I even talked to the chief of police. He sa I says, well, you know, how about I put a sign out there that says go down and point. See, because what I'll do is, well, you see the sign. Yeah. And I point in one direction. And so it's like, I thought, well, I've got a food barrel down there. Can I stand there and ask people to go down and give to the food barrel? You know, and he says, well, if they ask you about cannabis or, you know, marijuana, you go down there and anybody makes any money, then, you know, then it could become an issue. That's a great area. I'm like, man, I've been doing it under their license for how long? And, and, and you guys haven't said nothing, but as soon as somebody gets, and, it's, and the, the, sheriff, the chief told me, he says, it's a complaint driven system. Mm -hmm. That we've seen you out there for years, and we don't care, but now that somebody found out you're an independent contractor, because a lot of people think that I own the place. They're like, you're out here, rain, shines. I've been out there in thunderstorms, uh, lightning, yeah. <laughs> hail, snow. I got, we'll I mean, talk and more I love about it. this and, and have you back in the coming weeks to talk I'd like about to be that, back. I'll that take a situation. break from my show and come over here. Okay, because you've been doing a Friday night show. Friday I did night last show. week. Yeah. In, oh, in, thank uh, you. Thank hey, you you're Paul. welcome. Mercy TV, Mercy TV there org. in Salem. Yep, you can always so. call in. That's a live call-in television show. It's on CCTV Channel 23. Mm -hmm. um, we're putting more content on the Newport Weed Man. Uh, if you look Newport Weed Man on YouTube, then you can see all the content. And, and uh, next month, you'll be able to see the content with you on the show. Okay. And, and even with my little girl, Brianna, well, down, was on the show. We're down to just <laughs> two minutes here. Uh, Give us you your call. website one more time. It's goweedman.com. And you can go there. You can order shirts. That's one thing I can do. I, I, you can order my shirts online. I sell these for $20 a piece. They're uh, Go Weed Man on the front and then Smoke Weed Not Speed. I, 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 I kind of like that. I, I see some, some skinny people out there. I showed it to you today in Portland. They kind of said, mm. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, Eddie. Passing the I want to thank you, viewers, love. again. Uh, if you want more information about our doctor clinics and a referral service to doctors, around the country who can help you get a medical marijuana permit, then give us a call at 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. Next week, we'll have Mike McDermott, uh, who's a cameraman and one of the producers of a new movie, Oregon, State of Cannabis. He's got working with the actor Jim Belushi. John Belushi is his little brother. And uh, we'll be talking about that next week with Mike McDermott. I want to thank you guys for watching. We're going to go out on another great song by Mr. John Coronet. We'll be back next week and help us restore him. Yeah, restore him. Right. Another chapter as we turn the page. We exist within a Ukraine. I know that freedom's heard around the globe. Just where our future lies. Nobody knows. Oh, 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 let's make the best of it now. 
Cause you never know when the sky will fall Maybe the moon will reach the earth one day We're not the same race that we used to be Can't you see? Now the next time that you fall in